The uh, committee is uh, once again called to order. We apologize to um, all of you. Uh, we had as members to uh, run over to the House floor to cast three votes, um, but I think we can have um, an uninterrupted uh, period of time uh, now to move forward. So, Mr. Miller, let me ask you this. When, again, just to recap, um, the um, fraudulent letters were sent out um, uh, earlier in the month of June of 2009. Um, and on June 22nd or 23rd, um, it was clear that uh, these letters were fraudulent. But the vote was on a Friday of that week, on June 26th. So there was a three or four day period in which the members of Congress could have been notified that uh, the NAACP, American Association of University Women, the veterans and uh, other groups uh, uh, were not in fact uh, signatories to these letters uh, that were in opposition to the Waxman-Markey Clean Energy Bill. When did uh, you find out, Mr. Miller, when did the Coal Coalition find out that these letters, these fraudulent letters, had been sent out? In the evening of Wednesday, the 24th, I believe, of June, um, the Hawthorne Group uh, called our Senior Vice President for National Affairs and informed him uh, that, that uh, Mr. Bonner had uh, contacted Hawthorne to say that there were some fraudulent letters. Now, is your, is your um, Senior Vice President for National Affairs, was he the person coordinating the campaign? No, he uh, was not. That's our Senior Vice President for Communications. For Communications. Uh, so the Hawthorne folks, uh, apparently the, the examination that Venable did showed that uh, the Hawthorne group uh, tried to reach our Senior Vice President of Communications first, then called our Senior Vice President of National Affairs who then called me the morning of Thursday, June the 25th, so uh, a day before the vote. So the vote occurred um, on Friday evening. So as of Thursday morning now, you know personally yes, sir. Um, that these letters are fraudulent, that they've been sent to members of Congress who have been identified as key swing votes uh, on the bill. Um, and what did you do at that time, Mr. Miller? Uh, I discussed this with our Senior Vice President of Communications because the communication that came to us from Hawthorne was that, that uh, the Bonner firm wanted to know if it was okay to contact uh, the, the members of Congress and the local organizations. In my direction to our Senior Vice President of Communications, who then uh, made that very clear to the Hawthorne group, was absolutely, and in fact, that we demanded that they do so immediately. That's also been verified by the examination that, that the Venable firm did, that we were very clear in our instructions to Hawthorne, and in fact, based on their uh, discussions with, with the, the Hawthorne folks, that they imparted those directions to uh, Mr. Bonner that this notification of the members of Congress and the local organizations needed to be made immediately. Now, let me ask you this, Mr. Miller. On, uh, on that Thursday, um, uh, the day before we cast the vote, uh, Amongst your major funders are the Southern Company, Arch Coal, Peabody Coal. Um, were they told uh, by any uh, of your um, employees at the Coal Coalition uh, that uh, this uh, fraud had been perpetrated? No, sir. So on, on the day before the vote, uh, the Peabody Coal uh, Company did not know about this? That's correct. Um, and. Uh, did your did your lobbyists uh, for the Coal Coalition know about this? Uh, no, sir. So you did not tell your lobbyists. You did not tell your chief funders that this had occurred. That's correct. Um, and did you do any follow up to make sure that your instructions that the members of Congress be told um, that uh, this uh, fraud had been perpetrated? Um, uh, had occurred and that uh, they should know that uh, that these letters were in fact uh, fraudulent. Mr. Chairman, I was so convinced that because the Bonner folks had found the letters and had voluntarily come forward to say we have we have found these we we found these letters, that it was in their their personal interest, their their their, their company's reputational interest to address this issue, and that they had volunteered to, we will go deal with this immediately. I was 
convinced that, that their voluntary actions coming to the Hawthorne Group uh, and, and, and stating the problem and stating their desire to, to address that problem, that I was convinced that they uh, would do so. Well, you, can you understand, Mr. Miller, how somebody looking at this might be a little bit incredulous? Mr. Bonner has testified that he was paid $43,000. The Hawthorne Group, in turn, was paid millions of dollars uh, and had been contracted uh, by you for the preceding eight years with millions and millions of additional dollars that you had paid them. And yet on top of that, the Coal Coalition was trying to kill the Waxman-Markey bill on Friday. Uh, and uh, that this multi, multi-million dollar effort to kill Waxman-Markey uh, was funded by Peabody Coal, by Arch Coal, by the Southern Company, uh, by other entities um, that uh, were your principal funders. Uh, and it was all towards the goal of getting these swing votes on Friday to vote no uh, on the bill. So it seems hard to believe that being notified that, um, that, uh, that this had happened, uh, that uh, this fraud had been perpetrated, uh, was delegated on the day before the vote to Hawthorne, and then you assume that Mr. Bonner, uh, who had just been hired a couple of weeks before, this wasn't his issue, his passion. It was just he was being, you know, basically uh, hired to, for $43,000 to, to do some astroturfing. Uh, so it comes back to you, um, uh, Mr. Miller. You're, you're kind of giving us the, the Sergeant Schultz defense here. I, I, I see nothing. I know nothing. You know, I instructed that Hawthorne move on. I assume, you say, that Mr. Bonner then acted. Well, you know, we're coming down, we're in a situation here where that's putting a lot of responsibility on someone that you had only hired two or three weeks beforehand uh, who had in turn hired temporary employees. Uh, I think it comes back to you, Mr. Miller. I think it comes back to what the objective was on the most historic energy and environment bill ever on the floor of the House of Representatives that your organization had raised millions and millions of dollars to try to defeat. Uh, and I think that your responsibility, and I'll put it right on your shoulders, your responsibility uh, was to ensure that uh, the members of Congress knew uh, that this information was fraudulent. Uh, or other people in your, your lobbyists, your communications people, um, these are the high paid people. Uh, $43,000 to a subcontractor, uh, it seems to me, is not the place where this responsibility reposes uh, to ensure that the NAACP, uh, the American Association of University Women, veterans groups, senior organizations across the country uh, have had their good reputations uh, absconded with uh, by your coalition. So what responsibility, Mr. Miller, do you think you shoulder now in, rep in, in retrospect? Because I'm putting it on you, not and, and I'm not going to allow you to say you assumed that it would be in Mr. Bonner's best interest uh, to clarify this, uh, because he's very far down this communications food chain. Uh, have you gone? Ha, have you had enough time here to examine whether or not, in your own opinion, you did not do the job you should have done uh, to make sure uh, that this was corrected in the minds of these key members of Congress before they cast the vote? Mr. Chairman, I think there were two aspects to your question. One was, what was the, the motivation here? What was the goal? And let me reiterate. Uh, our board has directed us to support federal carbon management legislation, and in particular in regards to the Waxman-Markey bill, to make changes to it, not to defeat it. There is no accurate uh, 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 example anywhere, because it just doesn't exist, that our organization uh, opposed the Waxman-Markey bill before this, this uh, vote took place, either before the committee or on the House floor. Now, as to my personal uh, responsibility here, Mr. Chairman, I, I can tell you this uh, literally and not figuratively. Uh, a, a thousand times over the last three months, I have thought about what I should have done differently, not just my colleagues uh, uh, at uh, ACE or our consultants. And I would tell you that based on what I know now, uh, I would have drawn a line on a particular hour 
uh, if, if, if Mr. Bonner uh, had wanted to, uh, to make these contacts, I would have drawn a definite line that said, after this hour, if I don't have conclusive proof that these contacts have been made, both to the members of Congress and the local organizations, that I will go uh, to the halls of Congress and I will go uh, pass a note to whomever I have to at the staff level to make sure that the affected members uh, know this, that, that I send a fax or whatever I have to do uh, to make sure that that happens. And I don't accept, Mr. Miller, I don't accept the fact that you are arguing now that you did not oppose this legislation. We have an email here from uh, Hawthorne to Bonner, uh, in, in, in the, uh, uh, the email says, uh, okay, I now have the targets and we're ready to go uh, in the following distant districts with vets, seniors, minorities, uh, any combination uh, you think you can get. Uh, just need a few. Uh, you define for me, but, uh, but I'm thinking, you know, five, I guess, letters per district. Um, but then, as you look through these seven target members, uh, uh, next to one of the names, Hawthorne is saying to, uh, uh, to uh, Bonner here in the uh, email, uh, he's a potential uh, probable no vote uh, on here. So we're doing a, a little more intel to determine whether or not to keep him on our target list. In other words, if he's already no on the bill, then why spend money on him? Why spend millions of dollars from the Coal Coalition on him? So the very email, you know, that is being used to target all these members, seven members there two weeks before the vote, is to get a no vote. And so that's what the Coal Coalition was doing. Peabody Coal, Arch Coal, they didn't want a yes vote. They wanted a no vote on this bill. They're paying you your salary. They've got a Coal Coalition put together to defeat Waxman Markey. Uh, the email makes it clear they're targeting uh, members that might potentially vote yes, but as soon as they go no, uh, then take them off uh, the list. So, uh, so I'm having a hard time, Mr. Miller, in kind of parsing your sentences and understanding how you can possibly contend that this whole operation wasn't intended to defeat Waxman Markey. Sir, I will go back to the submission that the Hawthorne Group made on August 27th to this committee and the attachment to this, which has a, a, an exact copy of the information that we uh, 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 agreed to with uh, the Hawthorne group that they say they passed on to Bonner regarding our position here. And it, st it states very clearly that we are here to, to in this process, to make changes uh, to the bill. A and uh, now, you, you specifically, uh, and, and particularly in regards to, to a, a safety valve that would put an upper limit on the price Well, of here's allowance. the problem that we have, Mr. Miller, okay? Hawthorne's been working for you for eight years. You've given them millions and millions of dollars to be your principal wing of communication uh, in order to affect legislation. And you're telling us that in the final week before the most important vote on energy uh, legislation that could affect the coal industry, um, that, uh, that they're wrong in saying that trying to get a no vote is the key goal here, uh, and that as the list is being sent on uh, to Mr. Bonner, uh, that, uh, that that's not the objective. And I just have a hard time believing it, Mr. Miller. Uh, it seems to me that you were trying to kill the bill, that Peabody wanted the bill killed, that Arch wanted the bill killed, and that this is the message that got sent down, and that's what translates into these letters over here. Uh, that I have uh, put up on uh, the easel so that uh, the people here in the hearing room can see it, uh, that uh, these letters, you know, reflect a desire to communicate with voters, with congressmen, that their electricity rates will be doubled, that it will have other horrific consequences for our country, uh, and they're invoking the name of groups that represent the p poor people in our country, seniors in our country, uh, minorities in our country. Uh, and it seems to me that um, the real goal that you had at the end of the day uh, was to, um, to kill the bill. And that what you are sitting here trying to argue is that you have plausible 
deniability because you assume that when you told Hawthorne that Hawthorne would tell Bonner, who only got hired uh, three weeks before and a day later is hiring a temporary to uh, start to develop letters, uh, that somehow or other that would get passed down through the food chain beginning on uh, Thursday, so uh, the day before the vote. So none of these people would be in trouble right now if it had all been corrected on Thursday. We wouldn't be here. Huh? So it comes back to you and what happened in headquarters. Uh, as you're getting this information, the list is narrowing, it's getting smaller and smaller, the vote is obviously getting closer and closer. So these key members will decide whether or not your agenda to defeat the legislation, uh, because this email makes it clear that was the goal, um, uh, is going to be successful. And so it comes back to you again, Mr. Miller, and the people who fund your organization. That was what you were trying to do, uh, and this fraudulent activity was in your hands two days before uh, the vote, and you had a chance to clarify it, and you did not. Is there a question there, sir? Um, I'm giving you a chance to say you're right. Yes, I'm giving you a chance to say you're right, and I'm ashamed that, um, that we did not correct it when it came to headquarters, since our whole goal in this effort was to affect swing members of Congress, that when we knew that we had the responsibility, that we couldn't delegate it and then have it redelegated again and then have it redelegated down to a temporary employee, that we, as the coal coalition, as the organization representing all of these uh, companies that were giving us millions and millions of dollars, that we had the responsibility. Yes, there is a question there. Yes, we, uh, we definitely had the responsibility, as I said in my opening statement, and I've said a couple of times. And I am profoundly disappointed that we did not do that. And we have, in, in uh, our new uh, uh, ethics code, we now have a requirement that any time we have anything that, that is untoward that we can't verify within 24 hours, we're required to notify the member. But Mr. Chairman, I must respectfully say again, these 58 letters that were generated uh, and sent in by, uh, by Bonner to Hawthorne are a very, very small part of the grassroots, the legitimate grassroots program we have. One of the things that we filed with this committee in, its, in our submission to you yesterday was the telephone scripts that we used and that we generated thousands, uh, made opportunities available for thousands of, of constituents to touch base with their members. And if I might just take a few seconds to quote, uh, the America's Power Army supports the timely adoption of legislation that reduces carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions, protects consumers from unnecessary increases in energy costs, promotes energy independence, and encourages the development and deployment of cleaner that? technologies, underlined uh, in, the, in the text. This climate bill needs changes to make sure all that happens. One of the most important changes would be to protect consumers uh, is to put a limit on the price of emission allowances. This is what uh, thousands of, uh, of telephone calls, are. we encourage folks to say in thousands of telephone calls to targeted members, never to just vote no on this bill, but to make changes. And, and Mr. Chairman, you and others, Mr. Waxman and others on the committee were working diligently in the hours right up to the vote seeking changes to the bill to secure uh, 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 votes because it was not clear at all until the day of the vote that there would be enough votes to pass. And so we were very clear that the, that the, the, the policy situation at place here made it possible for additional changes to be made in that legislation. Okay, I, I'm going to uh, recognize Mr. Inslee. Uh, all I can say to you, Mr. Miller, is that it was in the interests of the coal coalition for these members uh, to think that the NAACP, veterans, seniors, and women's groups were opposed to the bill with 48 hours left to go, and that you had a chance to clarify it, but your goal was to defeat the legislation. And, uh, and that's why one of these members was taken off the list, because he was already a no vote on the bill on Waxman Markey, and so the targeting would go for the other six members. Okay, and all I'm saying to you, Mr. Miller, uh, is that when, uh, when, uh, when interests and opportunity coincide, you wind up 
in a situation where those who had an opportunity to stop and to clarify uh, create a uh, delegation process that may or may not be completed uh, before uh, the vote would be taking place. Uh, and that you, uh, as, the, um, as the head of this organization and the companies that you are representing, uh, had, an op had, a, had a responsibility uh, to clarify, a um, far, far greater responsibility than the temporary employee, than Mr. Bonner, than the Hawthorne group had. Uh, this was your plan. This was your organization. Everyone else was hired. Uh, and, uh, and it, it's, it's clear that the objective was to uh, kill the bill. And, uh, and that, was, that was what was in question at that time. So I, I just have a hard time in, uh, uh, in, uh, um, in accepting your explanation uh, because I think that 24-hour, 48-hour delay was just enough uh, to uh, perhaps contribute to your victory in defeating the legislation. Uh, and therein lies the real problem here, where it keeps coming back to you. Let me uh, conclude there and turn to the gentleman from uh, Washington State. Uh, well, it's clear after the chief executive officer of the Clean Coalition learned that the f Congress had been defrauded, that you knew you only needed to keep this silent for about another 48 hours to try to maybe pick up a couple more critical votes, because you were looking uh, for votes under your designation to change the bill under the fact that it wasn't going to change to kill the bill. And all you had to do is keep this, this fraud quiet for about another 48 hours. So I want to ask about your participation. Your entire goal of your organization is to influence Congress. Is, is that right? Mr. Miller? Um, uh, your entire our, goal of an organization is to influence Congress, is that right? We, we do uh, work at the state level, we do regulatory matters, uh, we do general education to the public, so the, the federal, direct federal lobbying has in fact only been part of our portfolios uh, since April of 2008 over the 16 year history of the organization. What I want to get at is that this isn't some peripheral responsibility, you're the, you're the chief, this is the big enchilada, the, the major leagues of climate change legislation and on June 25th, uh, you would describe it your highest priority was to get Congress to do your bidding. Wouldn't you say that's correct? Uh, our uh, clear direction from our board was to seek the adoption of federal carbon management legislation that could include a mandatory cap and trade program so long as it, it adequately met a number of principles that we had publicly been articulating for, for well over a year. Well, I'm, I'm just trying to get at your individual thinking on June 25th, uh, the hottest thing on your plate on June 25th was trying to influence Congress on the Waxman-Markey bill. It wasn't worried about the overhead of your computer system in Dubuque or something. Isn't that right? I mean, this was the hottest thing in your personal agenda. It's your whole reason for being at, getting up in the morning that day, wasn't it? The highest uh, priority of that particular day was to continue to seek changes to the Waxman-Markey bill with a particular right. focus on that's trying to get a That's what I'm out. getting at. So, so that day you knew that Congress had been defrauded. You had paid lobbyists physically present on the Hill trying to influence this legislation. And instead of picking up the phone to call your lobbyist who is under your direct control or sending them an email telling them to get to Representative Perello's office and everybody else had been defrauded as their first order of business that morning, Instead of doing that, your testimony is you passed it off to some subcontractor and told them maybe they should talk to the people. Is that your testimony? No, it is not my testimony. We didn't say may do this. We say insisted do this, excuse me. Do this now. And did you tell them to do it by 10 o'clock that morning? We did not. We said to do it immediately, and okay. urgency was there. And also, again, Mr. Inslee, I would, would, would direct your attention to the submission of the Hawthorne Group on August the 22nd. Uh, 27th, where they say, and I quote, after discussions with ACE, Hawthorne directed Mr. Bonner on the morning of June 25th to immediately contact the members of Congress and organizations, and Mr. Bonner agreed to do that. And according to Ms. Hamelman of the Hawthorne Company, the conversation with your agency did not include a specific discussion or instruction to make contacts before a day certain as the timing of the vote on the Waxman-Markey bill was uncertain. That was her testimony. I'll just put that uh, into the record. Um, so 
let me just ask you, if this was a criminal, if there was a criminal statute that says you can't defraud Congress by conveying information under a phony or fictitious name without authorization to do so, if that was a criminal statute, do you think that might have focused your mind a little more on making sure that you did not allow this fraud to continue? I'm not sure, sir, whether it was a criminal statute or, or anything. Well, else. I'm just at, we're trying to figure out why this, how this should, how we stop this from happening again. If it was a criminal statute and you were aware of that, do you think you might have been a little more prompt in notifying the affected congressman of this fraud? I, mean, I, I don't know. I've never really considered that question since, since I don't think there, there is one. But in any regard, as I've said before, we, in retrospect, I clearly recognize the responsibility and, and would absolutely do that differently myself. Well, you, you still, even as of this day, haven't notified the victims of this fraud of the fraud, have you? Uh, that's not uh, true, sir. We okay, well, let's find out about that. Mr. Bonner, uh, we have this telephone uh, training memo of how you trained your telephone callers and it basically instructed them to call people and tell them that, that your electrical rates could double because of some pending legislation in Congress. We went through that discussion a little bit later. You have that document in front of you. Uh, have you called the people who were called as a result of that fraud and told them that they were the victims of misinformation? Um, uh, first of all, Congressman. Uh, Congressman. Uh, the document that you um, showed me was a early training document um, that we had used. It was subsequently um, not used, I believe, um, in what we actually talked to people about. The other thing, sir, is that if you look at the letters themselves up on, your, on the board there that the chairman referred to, um, all of those letters um, talk about an um, increase in cost to consumers. It doesn't quantify it, and I might also add those letters don't urge opposition to the bill either. So do you have a doc, you're testifying that this document was never used, the one that you're looking at, and well, by the way, the, we'll the designate The talking exhibit. points was part of our early effort to refine what we were doing. And did you, did that document, was that used in training any of your callers ever? Um, I would have to check and, and get back to you with a precise answer on that. So it may or may not have been, is that what you're telling me? I'm telling you I'm not sure. Okay. Well, then, it's clear then that if it was used, which you have not investigated, you haven't gone back to try to clarify that with the people that your folks may have called. Is that correct? Um, what I do know is that when our people called and they had the discussion with constituents, they, if the constituent group was interested, we then sent them the letter that um, uh, you've seen, okay, and the letter itself um, Okay. has the information in it that I just referenced. Okay, we have your answers to interrogatories that were posed to your organization, and an answer was uh, prepared on Aiken Gump stationery, and it said, answer number six, one page of talking points was prepared to guide the temporary employees in their calls to third-party organizations. The talking points are attached here at tab A. Now let's get this straight. Is the document before you, tab A, which your interrogatories answered as saying being the talking points used to guide, quote, the temporary employees in their calls to third party organizations, close quote. Is the document you're looking at tab A? I'm sorry, sir? Is the document that was handed to you tab A? That's what you sent to us. Right, that you handed me, right? Right, okay. So I want to make clear you understand your organization, your counsel on your behalf. Right. We, the committee, ask you a question about this. And what you told us, you said, quote, one page of talking points was prepared to guide the temporary employees in their calls to third party yes. organizations. The talking points are attached here at tab a. Yes, sir. Now, I want to make clear so that everybody understands, you told the committee staff, and I don't know if this is under oath or not, but you told the committee staff that you had a talking point memo, you used it to train your employees in their conversations with third-party organizations, 
and that document makes reference to a doubling of electrical rates. Now, isn't that the situation here? Um, yes, sir. Um, uh, the uh, submittal that I believe you're quoting from the August 12th submittal from Aiken Gump, uh, our representative law firm, um, says that the talking points were prepared to guide temporary employees. And so, sir, what I'm saying is I don't know, and we certainly will get back to you whether that was used or not, but what I do know as a matter of fact is that what went to all the groups, all the 50, um, uh, all the uh, 43 groups that wrote that were legitimate, as well as the uh, fraudulent letters, all did not contain, none of them contained any reference to a doubling. That's great. I'm not asking about the letters. I'm asking about the phone calls. We ask you what you use to, to, to train people. You sent us tab A. It said mm -hmm. it made reference to doubling electricity. You haven't sent us any other tab B. You haven't sent us any other training document, have you? Um, well, just to um, stand here, yes or no? We we really have limited time here. Well, I'm trying to give you the best answer I can. So Let me just ask you: Did answer. you send us any tab B, C, or D of other training documents? Mr. Chairman, if Mr. Inslee would wants to ask about, uh, excuse me, could you identify yourself? Yes, sir? I'm Stephen Ross from Making Gump. Could you speak into yes, the microphone, I'm sir? I'm Stephen Ross from Making Gump. If you're asking a question about the letter that we wrote, uh, we'll be happy to respond. I don't think it's fair to ask Mr. Bonner, who was not the author of that letter, about that kind of parsing. Well, let me just ask you, you are Mr. Bonner's attorney, is that correct? Correct. So let me just ask you, did you send us any tab A, B, C, or D of any other training document other than was referenced in your letter of August 12, 2009? You, if you look at our letter, I think we describe it as a document that was Just, just I really appreciate, you should be a lawyer to know it helps to answer the questions. I do Did know. you, sir, and send us any tab A, B, C, or D of any other training document other than tab A that made reference to doubling electrical rates? That's a simple yes or no. No, there's no other tab. Thank you. That's no. all we need, sir. I'm going to ask Mr. Bonner a question. Mr. Bonner, your attorney, when we ask you, and it shouldn't take this long to get to the bottom of this, and it, if you guys could answer the questions, it would hurry up. We ask you what you told people. You told us that we had a training document. It made doubling electricity part of the discussion, and you did not provide us any other training document other than that one. Is that correct? Um, what's correct is what um, Aiken Gump um, submitted to you as a uh, Steve Ross just told you they're prepared to give you further information as you would like. Okay. Now, uh, it appears from this, to me, highly likely under these circumstances that at least some of your employees called people up and tried to scare the dickens out of them, telling them that there was a potential that their electrical rates were going to double as a result of some legislation. Now, have you tried to find out who was called and told that? so that you could make that right and let them know they were defrauded about that misstatement? The, what I do know they were all told was, because it's what was put in front of them in writing, so that's how I'm sure that it happened, was that their um, cost, of electricity, <coughs> cost of electricity could go up. And um, that they were, an, as they wrote in the letter, opposed to unaffordable increases in electricity. We, and, and that's what's in the letter. So, Mr. Miller, having heard of this, that the people that you paid, at, uh, according to their lawyer, used a training document to train their people to tell citizens of this country that their electrical rates were going to double, potentially, if this legislation passed, have you taken any action to fix that misrepresentation that took place, uh, at least at your initiation? First of all, we, we didn't pay Hawthorne, uh, uh, Bonner, and we're not going to. But, but secondly, to your question, uh, the first week of August, uh, a after this story broke, and, and we realized that perhaps not all of the local organizations had been contacted, but whether they had or hadn't, uh, our staff uh, contacted each one of these affected organizations, uh, personal with phone calls. The only one that we were not able to contact directly was the, the gentleman with the uh, Albemarle Charlottesville chapter of the NAACP, so we sent a Federal Express uh, letter to him, a letter of apology, for which we have uh, the receipt that it was uh, received. Right, I, so, I, I, so we absolutely expressed our deep apology uh, to them for what had happened. We couldn't apologize for the doubling 
a number here because the first time that we knew about that, or, or, or and we could have later on, but uh, I, I suppose, but we didn't know anything about uh, the fact that, that the, the Bonner folks may have used this doubling thing and, and until we, we just recently seen the submission. Okay, so are you going to try to cure that misrepresentation now with the people who were given that misrepresentation? I'm, I'm absolutely happy to. to uh, what are you going to do about that? Well, a, a second time, I'm happy to communicate with them orally uh, and or in writing to say if they received uh, from representatives of Bonner and Associates a, a representation that under the Waxman-Markey bill, electricity rates would uh, double. But by the way, that's I'm not, not our, that's never been. I want to make sure understand. I'm not talking about just these people that wrote letters falsifying the NAACP. I'm talking the people that could be thousands of people that Mr. Bonner's organization called and tried to defraud him into thinking their electrical bills were going to double as a result of this legislation. I'm talking about those people that got the calls. What are you going to do to tell those people that they got a load of bunk from this organization using your money? What are you going to do about that? Um, the, 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 uh, the investigation that, that Venable uh, did showed that there, of the 58 letters that, that Mr. Bonner's firm uh, obtained, that 44 of those were legitimate letters that these these entities uh, submitted and, and Mr. Miller, I got I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I I don't like to interrupt witnesses, but you're just not answering the question. I want you to listen to my question. Yes, sir. What are you going to do about the people that Mr. Bonner's organization apparently or probably I believe or may have called and told that their electrical rates may double fraudulently? using money that in one way or another came from you, what are you going to do about that misinformation? I, I would be happy to send a letter to each uh, organization that, that uh, Bonner and Associates reached out to as a follow-up uh, to this uh, hearing to say to them that if, in fact, someone on behalf of Bonner and Associates said that their electricity rates uh, would, would uh, double here that, that uh, because of the Waxman-Markey bill, that that is not a position that uh, that ACE has has ever taken. I'm happy. Uh, all I know about are the 58 uh, organizations where letters came from. I don't know how many others were called. And would I'd you favor me with a copy of those letters when they go out, please? Absolutely. Thank you, because I think you need to start sharing that information with members of the U.S. Senate. And I'll tell you why. Our nation is involved in a great discussion about how to deal with this problem of CO2 in the atmosphere. I think there's some ways the coal industry can play a, a productive and positive role in that discussion, including advocating for research for ways to sequester CO2, research that I have wholeheartedly supported and voted to put a billion dollars a year in for research in the hopes that we can find a way to sequester that CO2. But this participation of your organization while the Senate is debating this issue, while you have let this stand, you should make a full court press to go over to tell every member of the U.S. Senate this is not going to double people's electrical rates. You know it's not going to double electrical rates. You're sorry that you attempted to defraud, didn't attempt, but somebody using your money attempted to defraud people to that effect. And you don't want them making a decision based on that fraud. Now, I think you should do that with members of the U.S. Senate, very specifically and personally by you, the guy who's responsible for part of this. Now, will you do that? I'm not certain that I can personally see all 100 members, but I will tell you and the other members of the committee that we will be extremely responsible in, in uh, any assertions that we make here in regards to cost that we will share with uh, members of the United States Senate and subsequent discussions with members of the House that there is clearly a range of, of, of belief here on what these price increases may be. And, and Mr. Inslee, the price increases that, that are going to take place here will, will widely vary depending on what kind of provisions are in the bills. Uh, will there be a safety valve or a price collar? Will there be carbon capture and storage? Not only funding, but the framework for how uh, pipelines are going to be sited and, and there are many, many aspects of this that, that depending on the, 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 the final details, the cost will vary greatly. And so we will, as we have in the past, make sure that people understand that un, under any rigorous climate change regime, 
energy prices will go up. Well, I, the variance I of that will be will be dependent upon about what the provisions uh, of the final. I will look provide. forward to evidence that you are broadly trying to tell the American public and the U.S. Senate that the CBO and EPA did an analysis of the bill and concluded that there would not be any significant increase in utility bills. In fact, low-income families could actually see a benefit because of the provisions we built into the bill to help low-income families, and that, and that a, a cost estimate in total was less than a postage stamp a day for a family of four. I will look for public evidence that you were making that clear to the public. And frankly, I think you got, you got that obligation given what went on here. And I hope that you will fulfill it. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, let me let me say this to you, Mr. Miller. Here is a New York Times story um, in uh, early August, and what the New York Times is reporting here is that it says Duke Energy also left the American Coalition for Clean Coal Electricity, citing. Um, climate policy. Quote, it was clear that many influential members could never support climate legislation in 2009 or 2010, no matter how it was written, Tom Williams, a Duke Energy spokesman, said. Uh, and so, again, I agree with their, the Duke uh, Energy conclusion. Uh, I, I think it is very consistent with what happened on that Thursday and Friday before we cast the vote uh, at the Coal Coalition uh, that they were trying to defeat uh, the legislation. I think the emails that we have been able to uh, unearth and identify uh, points in that direction as well, that once someone was committed to voting no on final passage, that they could move on. And Mr. Bonner and, Mr. and uh, the Hawthorne group. Uh, and all of the rest of your lobbyists who had been hired for this effort uh, can continue to focus on obtaining uh, the no votes. But I do believe that you, ha you were given notice. I mean, Mr. Bonner fired the temporary employee uh, on uh, the 23rd. Uh, the vote is on the, the 26th. You have notice uh, by Wednesday night, two days before the vote, uh, that this is information in the hands of Congressman uh, that could mislead them about whether or not they should uh, vote for uh, the waxman markey bill. Uh, so I do believe it comes back to you, and I do believe that Duke Energy and leaving your coalition, uh, one of the largest southern utilities, um, uh, is accurate in that assessment. Uh, and that is why, again, as we are going, as we are looking at this, it, it comes back to you. It comes back to your organization, Mr. Miller. And, uh, uh, and going forward, uh, I think it puts a, a real burden on you uh, to prove that you do want legislation uh, and that you uh, are not going. You are not going to allow for this type of activity to continue. You are not going to allow for misinformation to be disseminated in your name, uh, and that uh, it will be a debate uh, that uh, will be based upon um, accurate representations of what is occurring, um, because I. By far, the greatest responsibility is on your shoulders, given the fact that you knew two days before the vote, um, because um, this was an agenda that I think Duke Power and I, at least, believe was aimed at killing the legislation, and that in 2009 and 2010, that uh, if that could be achieved, then that would be the goal. So um, that's my conclusion. I don't know, Mr. Inzi, if you have any um, concluding statements that. Uh, um, uh, that you uh, want to uh, talk about at this time. Um, I guess my only statement would be this. Everyone is capable of making mistakes. There are gradients of whether it is negligence, carelessness, gross recklessness, or intentional. I am just saying on how people look at organizations, it is how they respond after that happens. And I just have to say uh, to Mr. Miller specifically, I have not seen evidence yet that you have tried to repair the disinformation campaign that is associated here, adequate to the nature of this debate. And I think you have an opportunity to do so. I just hope you take it. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask one final question of you, Mr. Bonner. Did you uh, discipline, fire, or place on administrative lead, leave any permanent Bonner employee uh, as a result of this incident? 
Um, no, sir. You did not? No, but I will say to you, sir, that for me personally, my name's on the door. It was a awful um, uh, experience, something I um, uh, am very regretful happened, uh, something I'm going to do Herculean efforts that I hopefully demonstrated at the beginning of which to the committee to make sure it never happens again. The biggest penalty was paid, is being paid by me personally. 25 years I've had this business and I, I can't tell you how bad I feel personally about this. Um, it's a small business, we're not a big corporation and it's um, something uh, that I want to uh, be able to turn around, something that I want to earn uh, a, a, a reputation as the best in the business from corrective action we've taken and the penalty's been paid by me. Uh, well, um, Mr. Bonner and uh, Mr. Miller, um, I think here is here's what we learned today. Uh, we learned that the uh, Coal Coalition learned two days in, in advance of the historic vote on the House floor uh, that a fraud had been perpetrated. Uh, Mr. Bonner had sent that information uh, to the Coal Coalition. Uh, but although the Coal Coalition knew of this, it took precious little effort uh, to ensure that members of Congress knew uh, that this fraud had been perpetrated. My own feeling is that uh, while you might point the finger back at a rogue subcontractor and a rogue temporary employee, that since you did have notice two days in advance that the responsibility rested on your shoulder uh, to make sure that your coalitions, your, the coal coalition, uh, notified the NAACP, the American Association of University uh, Women who have built over generations, their reputation, um, that this fraud had been perpetrated, uh, that the responsibility was on your shoulder. They are outraged, so am I. Uh, you had a much higher responsibility uh, than it appears you discharged uh, in terms of ensuring that this was corrected before that historic vote. You know, the ultimate question is framed by Senator Baker, uh, 35 years ago is still relevant here. What did you know? When did you know it? And what did you do in order to correct what was obviously wrong uh, that was occurring under uh, the guise of your responsibility? And so that's really, in my opinion, uh, what you have to conclude uh, that occurred here. The goal from the record was that it was to obtain no votes opposition votes to the Clean Energy Bill. Uh, and it, as soon as that no vote was obtained, that the focus went on other members. It was clear that it was going to be a very close vote. And it was clear that it was also in the Coal Coalition's interest to not immediately correct the record. Uh, and there is little evidence um, that uh, the kind of active effort that should have been made did occur. So. Um, we thank all of you, the witnesses for being here today. Uh, and we thank especially the university women and, uh, and you, Mr. Shelton, representing the NAACP um, for contributing uh, to uh, this hearing. Um, we are going to proceed now uh, for the rest of the year in trying to develop legislation uh, that truly goes to the heart of the responsibility that we have in order to protect our planet. It is running a fever. 40% uh, of that fever has been created by coal that has been burnt in our country and around the world. Uh, we have a responsibility to put together legislation so that our country will be the leader. Uh, my hope, Mr. Miller, uh, is that your coalition will decide uh, that you want to work towards getting yes votes and to do so uh, in a way that makes our country the leader and that the impression that Duke Energy has, and I think many others, that you do not want legislation under any circumstances in 2009 and 2010 is wrong. And that we not hear again information about the, do, the science that is being questioned uh, by your organization, the, the doubling of electricity rates, the outrageous information that has been coming forward is repeated. Uh, and so that's the, um, the hope that we have, uh, that we can work together. Uh, but uh, this hearing, I think, has helped to illuminate 
the pathology that unfortunately exi existed in our political system in the first six months of this year in trying to debate this issue. And perhaps in some way this hearing is going to help going forward to make sure that it does not occur again. This hearing is adjourned.